Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the UK Connection. It's Saturday. What's happening, everybody? And uh, a big hello to my uh, comrades here, Mr. Simon Bray, and Mr. Stephen Reed. Of course, we got a, a different poster behind Stephen's left shoulder today, as you've noticed. Hopefully, you've noticed. There, there, were, there is a reason for that, which you will find out during the episode, right? Yes. Yep. That guy right there. Anyway, before. <laughs> Today is uh, our return to uh, Melodic Rock and AOR. We've got three albums for you to talk about. But before we do that, uh, I will let uh, my esteemed colleagues here uh, get us started on the beer conversation first, because that's how we start off this show. Whether you like it or not, that's what we do. Simon, what's you drinking today? And I hope you're feeling better, my friend. Feeling a little bit better. I'd say I'm feeling about, uh, on the Stephen Reed scale, about... Uh, 89.573% bet. Well, at this precise moment in time. That's pretty good. That's pretty I'm, feel, good. I'm feeling so well like I've been demolition man. That's how well I'm feeling. Yes, indeed. Um, yes, I have got me a beer. And I'm that kind of guy that walks around. And this, you know, let's be honest, this was in Tesco, a big crappy supermarket. And I thought, holy shit, look at that can. Look at that dragon. Look wow. at it. Oh, Ooh, I've got to have it. A king slayer. King, no? yeah. king slayer. Slayer of kings. And what what does mm. what does a king slayer need to be in, kids? A can? Oh, it's true. No, it's got to be. Ah. In the list. That's right. It's, it's a sexy little uh, eight percent, I think. It's a double IPA. So uh, in about an hour's time, I'll be talking even more bollocks than usual. So woohoo! Give it up for me. That's not possible, Simon. That's not possible. Oh, I see what you did there, Stephen. Thank you. I, I will say uh, I was given a can, I don't even remember what it's called, of, of some double IPA, 8.5%, something or other. It's sitting in my fridge. I almost pulled that out for today, but then I'm like, nah, that's not a good idea because about 20 minutes into it, I'll be just babbling incoherently and that's not a good thing. So I'll, 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 I know you guys can handle that stuff a little better than me, so I opted to get something safer. But anyway, on to Stephen. I'll divulge mine in a second. Well, I, I feel like I've missed my calling because I like to read the back of a bottle. I should have saved this for a Tigers of Pantan show, I think, really. I've got Cairn Gorm Wildcat is what I've got. It's a bit of a naff wildcat, but we'll, we'll go with that. But this is a smooth, deep, amber-coloured beer with a complex malt, fruit and hop flavour. Strong and distinctive like the powerful, sleek Scottish wildcat it is named after. And I think to myself, do they write this nonsense on the back and then work out what picture they want to go on the front? Or do they put the picture on the front and then just tailor this drivel so that I could, I mean, I could write this. I could do this for a living. I could write this nonsense for a living. Anyway, it's 5.1% and looks a little bit like this. Cool. Just... Could I could I get you to say the name again? Cam Gorn? Is that like a word? Or is that just something they made it up is. here? Cairn. Cairn Gorm. Gorm. So I live not far from the Cairn Gorm Mountains. Oh, so it's like it's a it's a place, it's a thing. Gotcha. Yeah. The Cairn Gorms are a mountain range just north of where I am. Maybe about an hour or so north of where I am, maybe not even quite as much as that. Uh, up in the Highlands of Scotland is where you're headed towards for the Cairn Gorms. Uh say and um, wild park thing that's not the phrase i'm looking for but who cares uh, and it's beautiful and um, we holidayed there a couple years ago okay very nice place. so that's what the cairn gorms are it's kind of a cool name and that's i'm sure it's delicious right it looks looks good uh, i have today from the cape may brewing company in cape may new jersey a brown honey porter deceptively easy drinking dark ale and this mm. is uh five point four percent, and it looks like this. Oh, that looks good, Peter. Yeah, and mm. so it doesn't smell much like honey, but let me see where I would taste. Tastes like a very roasted, malty porter. I don't really taste any honey at all. It's pretty good. Not too bad. Looks great. This is mm -hmm. lovely. I mean. I Good, got a good flavor. It's interesting because usually uh, when I've had honey beers before, like beers made with honey, usually there's like an inherent sweetness. There's really no sweetness to this at all. There's, in fact, I get it. There's almost like a little like caramel kind of chocolate thing going on, but no honey, but it's good. It's 
good if you like uh, like a, a kind of roasted uh, porter type of a beer. Very good. And I'm drinking it in the Pine Island Brewing Company Little Goblet, which sadly enough, this brewery no longer exists. But uh, that's fairly close to where I live. So cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. How is the Kingslayer? My close folk. There you go. That's the important thing. All right. Uh, who would like to introduce the three albums today? Oh, Stephen Wood. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so. Okay, I shall briefly introduce them and then I'll waffle a bit longer about them before we talk about them. <laughs> that's all right. Okay. I'll waffle at length. There you go. So we're starting off with the, and I would even say on this channel, much maligned debut album from Asia, so the self-titled 1982 Asia album. From there, we shall be going to 1991 and the debut album from The Storm. Okay, with lots of names on here that people will recognize. And then from there, we shall be going to the Man Mountain. Look at him here, what an imposing figure Mr. Michael Bolton is on the front of everybody's crazy. He doesn't look the most comfortable, natural, sort of perme haired AOR rock god, does he? So this is the they made an AOR album selection. And the answer is yes. Yes, he did. And probably more than one, I would suggest I too. Would but this so, is the yeah. one that we pulled. Yep. So yeah, so that's that's the three. To start with Asia. Okay. So he says with far too many things open on his desktop. So this was released in 1982, 8th of March 1982 on Geffen. And Asia were, of course, John Wetton from King Crimson, Roxy Music, Uriah Heep, UK, Wishbone Ash, playing bass and singing. We had uh, on guitars, Steve Howe from Yes. On drums, Carol Palmer from, well, Atomic Rooster from many moons ago, but obviously Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And then the kind of the wild card, Jeff Downs from, well, the Buggles, uh, and admittedly from the drama lineup of Yes, with his Buggles mate Trevor Horn also in tow. So obviously, with that background, this was bound to be a prog rock monster, wasn't it? Bursting at the seams with intricate epics. And yet, the very fact that it was produced by Mike Stone, who you can see has done New England, we have worked with Journey, April Wine, Tommy Shaw, White Snake. I could go on, Helix, Rat, 10, Y&T, Foreigner. That should be the first big giveaway that something else was going on here, even if Mike Dean did his very best with the logo and the artwork to decide that this was definitely going to be prog. I think we're misleading everybody until this went on the turntable, really. Anyway, it was a huge success. Got to number one in the US, it got to number six in Germany, Number 10 in the Netherlands, 11 in the UK, 13 in Japan, sorry, in Australia, 15 in Japan. It went four times, four, not just two, but four times platinum in the US, three times platinum in Canada. It went platinum in Japan, and it went gold in Australia, France, Switzerland, and here in the UK. Supposedly, it was 1982's biggest selling album in the US, and he, at the moment, and only time will tell, both went into the top 20 in the US singles charts. This was a smash, everybody. That it was. Yeah, that was, uh, well, I'll talk about it on my turn, but yeah. Simon, what are your thoughts on the first Asia album? Thanks for asking. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that I like Asia's first album. I like it a lot. I know. Wow. Who'd have thought it? Now, um, it's taken me a long time to get my shit together with Asia's first album. Um, other than the singles, um, which didn't really do very well over here at all, did they? I think each of the moment made it as far as in the big number 46. In fact, it did. I'm, I'm telling you that as a fact. Um <clears throat> I think I got Alpha before I got this. Really? Yeah. I think I feel like I feel like I did, and it, I don't have because I never get into the brog seat, as you know. I don't have that. Oh, he was in Kim Crimson thing. I mean, virtually nothing to me. 
I don't have that Emerson, Lake and Palmer uh, thing. That just makes me want to go, <laughs> yeah, don't like you. Um, I, uh, <laughs> oh, cue the abuse. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, uh, I re the only thing I kind of do really have is I do like, and always have like the Buggles. Uh, just say, just say, huge fan. I, I listened to that, listened to Video Kill the Radio Stising, um Kid Dynamite. Said, absolutely awesome. And can I possibly, possibly, before I pop on any further, recommend Trevor Horn's book? Okay. Just don't, just don't come out of it very well. Just say, okay. just say. Um, but this album, I really, I, I really like this album. Um, and do you know what? You know, you know when Stephen Fry once said that Abba is just that little bit better than they needed to be. Yeah, I think this album is as well. I think it could have been a really bog standard kind of melodic rock kind of thing, but it's just that little bit better. You know, some good songs, they're not necessarily, you know, cli the kind of cliche kind of um, shite that was around at the time. Um, you know, sung well, I think that's another good thing, isn't it? You know, just like um, John Waite, um, John Wetton has great diction. Can yeah. You can you can tell what he's saying, you know. And it's not all oh baby baby, oh all, all that kind of stuff. It's just like pretty concise. It's less than forty five minutes long. Um, really good. Um, melodic rock. But if if we go back to other conversations that we've had, you can see that you know the keyboards they are a bit um, Greg Geoffrey in places. They are, some of it, it you can see that, say, for instance, um, he said, um, Wild, uh, yeah, Wildest Dreams. You, you could see that being a Magnum song, Tony Clark in writing that. Well, I could, because that's the kind of guy that I am. But, um, you know, Heat of the Moment's great, Only Time Will Tell's great, Soul Survivor's great. Um, I like practice everything except here comes the feeling um it's really it's really good pop rock pop rock record i can see why it sold millions and i can also see why they then went on to sell about eight records in the rest of the career <laughs> you because know, i imagine you know the ubiquitousness of it in america is that a word it's ubiquity in america probably pay, probably pissed people off and you know they did look like um you know to quote quentin chris like a bunch of bank managers going to work didn't they you know, and if you go back and you look at the videos, and I have, <laughs> yeah, okay, um, I, we really like it. And, you know, one thing I I, I, I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to absolutely slaughter the guitar solo in um, Heat to the Moment because it's always quite annoyed me. That kind of like thing that he does, you know, because most guitarists would be like, oh, it'd be, um, kind of like, oh, Van Halen's around now. I'll just uh, really go for it, and he kind of doesn't. And that, and like all yeah, the time, yeah. yeah. Since we decided to do this one, I've listened to it, you know, at least once a day, every day for the past few weeks. So I've actually decided I now quite like it, you know. Uh, and and of an album of stuff that I actually do like, you know, I'll st I, I stand up for this record. It's not my favorite Asia album. Okay. I like I like um, all the Reformation albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I know nothing about John Payne. Don't even know who he is. But um, yeah, um, I, I like this record. It's really concise, prop, proper melodic rock record. But I cannot see, in many ways, why it sold shitloads and other things that we talk about didn't. Other than it's a little bit better than it needs to be. That's a really good okay. point. That's a really good point. I think you've got lots of reasons in play as to why it sold loads and loads more than other albums that arguably deserved it more than this one. And that's not to, to put a slight against this album. It has had a hard time on quite a lot of the shows that I've been on, and that's because I have been sitting in the prog seat uh, at that point, and people have spoken about taking it off the turntable and tossing it across the room at pace because they disliked it so much on first listen. I find it to be an odd concoction, is what I find this album to be, uh, because they are, with the notable exception of Jeff Downs at that point, three prog legends. Jeff Downs has had a decent career to this point, don't get me wrong, and he's had a massive hit 
was a pop single, it's a really good pop single, and the album that comes off is really good. But I, I, I often wonder what the motivation was to make an album that's much more 1982 than it was being close to the edge. And none of it should work. I, I mean, you, if someone has sat you down and said, that's what these guys are going to do, you would go, <laughs> I don't think so, so, you know? And it's weird because Jeff Downs brings a real pop sensibility. I agree with what Simon said, there, there is a definite pompousness to what he's doing. Some of the sounds he uses are a bit naive, I would suggest for the time, but Steve Howe barely adapts his style at all and it should all just bounce off each other and become a total mess. Simon mentioned about, you know, some of the soloing and he has always had that trademark it doesn't flow. That's a technical <laughs> term, that's it. I didn't yeah, know biddly, 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 biddly. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't go it doesn't flow into it. See, that's that's how things flow. Yeah. He goes biddly, biddly, biddly. it's very staccato mm. and broken up and precise and meant. And he brings that, and Carl Palmer is still sitting at the back making his drums black and blue. He's just hammering the life out of them because, well, that's what Carl does. That's just what he's there for. Don't invite him and expect him to treat the drums nice. And yet, he at the moment is glorious, hook laden, humongousness that lives and dies on a, on a really rememberable chorus. And only time will tell was maybe a bit schmaltzy, but John Wetton's vocals sell it. Carl Palmer's in a great little shuffle beat behind it all. Soul Survivor, which was released as a single, maybe just too late. Maybe they kind of they'd already sold the volume they were going to sell. It didn't become a massive hit, but I think it's one of the best things on the album. It's maybe a little more proggy, um, and I think that how adds a bit more of himself to it than he does maybe elsewhere. But Jeff Downs again, the keyboards are really commercial. Uh, and the melody that runs through it is that is AOR. I don't think all the album is, interestingly enough. Um, time again, it kind of tries to straddle the gulf between yes, ELP, because Palmer really brings the bombast. I would say that Jeff Downs is trying to kind of emulate some of that ELP largeness that, that that's kind of there. I think it's one of the, the, the stronger, but probably it's an atypical track to the album. Um, and I also really like the totally over the top Wildest Dreams. It's much more obvious. It's, that is, it's always <coughs> reminds me of lots and lots of UK AOR bands that didn't make it. It's kind of got that sound from that time. Um, I'm not necessarily sold on all the deeper cuts. Cutting it fine, it's a little confused to me. Without you and One Step Closer, they're okay. They're, there's nothing here that's terrible. In the end, and I've had this album for as well as long as I can remember, probably, I've never really been convinced that it's out and out AOR or that it's out and out melodic rock. But mm. it's definitely closer to that than it is anything else I can put my finger on. It's got a kind of progressive intent, but it ne that never comes to the fore, and therefore you're left with a, a melodic rock album and not the prog album that an awful lot of people that will have added the numbers when they bought this. There'll be lots of people that have bought this album that didn't like it because they expected something different entirely. That said, if these guys had delivered, I think, what was expected from them, it would never have been the success that it became. Um, and just to kind of swing around, I would agree, is this their best album? Not for me personally, uh, I am aghast that you don't know the John Payne era, Simon, because I think that would be right up your street. Send me some. <laughs> it is, I, I shall. It is really over-the-top, keyboard-led. John Payne is very theatrical vocally. He will you'll either love him or loathe him. I know lots that don't really take to him. I do. That's my favourite era of the band, even though I'll admit that some of the original band lineup albums are better. I prefer tracks. Aura is a great place to start with the John Payne era. But anyway, yes, Asia, I like this album a lot. I'm not necessarily torn to go back to it very often. But then when I do, I think, yeah, actually, this is, it always feels much better than I think it's going to be, for some strange reason. So yeah, that's that's Asia for me. I mean, I, I bought this when it first came out. So I've had this for, you know, over 40 years now. And 
I was one of those guys who I, I really at the time was not really much of a prog rock guy. I listened to a few bands here and there. Uh, I knew of Yes, obviously. Um, I knew of all the other bands, but I really wasn't listening to them. But I bought this because of the connection to Yes and the album cover sold me. And I was like, all right, you know, why not get it, right? But it's not a prog album. And, you know, if it sold 4 million copies here in the States, you know, by 1982... I don't know if the masses who are into ELP and Yes and King Crimson really were, were going to buy 4 million copies of this. So I think 3 million of these copies were probably to people who have no idea who any of these guys are. But because they were playing this shit all over the radio, and let me tell you, here they played this stuff constantly on FM rock radio. You couldn't escape Asia anywhere. I mean, you know, Heat of the Moment was all over the radio. Only Time Will Tell was on the radio. Soul Survivor, uh, briefly. They played Wildest Dreams, too. Uh, Here Comes the Feeling was played on the radio. They played everything on the radio. Um, For me, I like some of the hits. I think Heat of the Moment is a terrific song. It's not prog. It's, like you said, Stephen, it's closer to melodic rock AOR, which really wasn't a thing, a term back then. But that's a, it's, it's a pop rock album, right? Soul Survivor, for me, Soul Survivor and Cutting It Fine and maybe Time Again are the ones that kind of come closest to what these guys did before because uh, there is some really good musicianship on those songs. And not that there isn't throughout the whole album, but I think this album wins and was a success because the songs are all really memorable. They have great hooks. And I think if it would have been more progressive and more 70s prog, it wouldn't have caught on with the masses. I think because all the songs are so brief and, and like Simon said, concise and catchy, that's the reason why people loved it. I will say um, I have a weird history with this band because quite frankly, I have a whole bunch of their albums. I, I may have one or two of the John Payne era albums. The only one I ever listened to, and I don't even really need to listen to it much anymore because I've heard it a million times is this one. Uh, I don't like the follow-up at all. I think Alpha, they came out with it too quick after this one. And it's just way too many ballads for me. I know they were trying to hit on the success of this and get more hit singles. Uh, I don't like Alpha. I don't like the reunion albums at all. I want to. I want to love all of it. And then they changed the lineup so often. You had Steve Howe coming and going. You had Mandy Meyer from Crocus. What the fuck is a guy from Crocus doing in Asia? I mean, you know, all this weird stuff. Uh, I think the John Payne era stuff, I, I haven't heard every album. What I've heard is really good. And it, but it just got like here in this country, these guys could, Asia couldn't get arrested here. It's like after that second album, man, maybe the third album, they just disappeared from the face of the earth and nobody cared. Uh, and, you know, once all the original guys or most of them were gone, I mean, I saw Asia featuring John Payne in a bookstore in Wappingers Falls, New York, back in like the early, early 2000s. It was John Payne, Jeff Downs, and I couldn't tell you who else was in the band at the time. And there was like 10 people there. And they literally set up, did like a meet and greet, played a cup, played a little set. And I'm like, man, how the mighty have fallen. This is Asia. And they can't even draw 15 people to a bookstore in New York. I'm like, ugh. So I don't know. But anyway, uh, I really like this album a lot. I think to me, it's their crowning achievement. Uh, but again, it's not for everybody. You know, if, if you want to hear ELP and Yes and King Crimson and all the other history that these guys have had, this ain't it. But it's slick. It's well-produced. Lots of hooks. The instrumentation is there, but it's very kind of compact. I totally agree with you 100% about Steve Howe. I think his solos on here, other than like maybe a couple tunes, are just very kind of, I don't know, they're just like like there. Uh, it's But that's Steve Howe, right? Either, uh, you know, I mean, Steve, to me, Steve Howe has got to play like sprawling epic songs. That's, that's where he shines the most. Steve Howe playing like pop songs, uh, it's not quite what he needs to be doing. But it all works here, I think. And, you know, he's got, so, what's his face has such a great, um, John Wetton has such a great voice. And I think he is the star of the show here for me. Uh, his vocals is what makes this album and this band in general. And I think we finally realize what a great talent, especially vocally, a great bass player too, but especially vocally. I think this album really, really showed what he could do in this kind of format. And again, if you were to ask, he's not with us anymore, but if you ask John Wetton what kind of music he prefers singing, it's probably something like this, right? 
his solo albums are more like this. You know, uh, his early days in King Crimson, notwithstanding, I think you look at most of his career after he kind of liked this more song based kind of pop rock type of thing. That's that's and that's where he shines. So. So, yeah, I like this a lot. Uh, I don't listen to it much anymore. I don't really need to. But to me, this is quality through and through. But it ain't prog rock, folks. Not at all. Thank you. Two, two, sorry. One, two things. Two things. Um, one, it reminds us that, like most genres, melodic rock is a broad church. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, it, it is a melodic rock album more than, more than it's anything else. But I think it's got just enough progginess for those of us that don't like to be, you know, too far into the prog seat, as it were. We know we're just, we're just peeping through the window of the uh, prog house. I yeah. like that. Yeah, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, I find the pain era very interesting. That's, I mean, I had the first three albums, and I had them for a long time before I saw Asia. They opened for Paul Rogers, which is a strange mix in itself. Yeah. Uh, and that shows you where the band was at that stage. But if I said to you, Peter, would you like to see a band that has got Guthrie Govan on, gu on guitar, yeah. Chris Slade on drums, it's got Jeff Downs on keyboards, and it's got a guy called John Payne playing bass and singing, you would go, I'll go see them. Yeah. Well, that was the band I saw. So, I mean, the musicianship that was on stage was just unbelievable. It was just so good. And they reinterpreted the early stuff really well. Guthrie Govan didn't have to be too faithful, which I liked. He was given a bit of room to go be himself and on the back of that I started buying that era of albums and Aura was where I came in and interestingly it's more melodic rock, it's smoother and yet it's more progressive it's a really kind of strange mix of everything going on with it and we went to see them and you're absolutely right because on the, on their own they headlined the G2 in Glasgow which is one of the smallest venues I've been to in Glasgow and it wasn't full and they were tremendous and then I think within the year the original lineup had got back together again. And a lot of people said, oh, how could he leave John Payne behind? Well, selling out theatres and bigger or playing rooms about the size of my front room. Yeah. You've got to make a living, don't you? It's as simple as that. And you're not going to say no to that. And it started the ball rolling again for Jeff to end up in yes and various things to happen. So you can't criticise him, but that's the era that I still have the most fondness for because of that. Okay, so album number two is the self-titled debut from The Storm, released through Interscope in 1991. Now, we've already discussed Bad English on the show, and in many ways, The Storm was what the other guys, minus Steve Perry, of course, who we may well come to at some point in the show, that's what the other guys were doing. They were doing this. The initial lineup was made up of three ex-Journey guys. Okay, so you had Steve Smith on drums, who plays on this, but we would leave not long after. Greg Rowley on keys, Ross Valley on bass. And then on guitars, you had a guy called Josh Ramos, who had played in Le Mans. And he would become one of those, I think on the back of who he played with here, one of those guys that would turn up on lots of different things. So he was in a marker called Two Fires, China Blue with Tony Mills. He ended up in Hardline, funnily enough, trying to fill the shoes of Mr. Sean been practicing that line um and also in a band called the view which i'll come to in a second or two uh, and on vocals a guy called kevin chalfont or chalfant i don't quite know which way to go with that who really is largely remembered for his likeness vocally to steve perry which i think is a little unfair but we'll find out on that he very nearly joined journey and did i think perform in a band at some private function kind of thing and then steve perry returned Okay, he has fronted Alan Parsons uh, along with a whole load of different things. He was in 707, Shooting Star, Two Fires with Josh Ramos, AOR, the band, not just the genre. Uh, he also released a couple of solo albums. So the history goes that Valerie Ramos and Chalfont have been working together in a band called The View or The Vu. I really don't know what that means, but there you go. It's a very journey cover, that isn't it? Isn't that a very journey cover? Okay. Uh, and supposedly this band couldn't snag themselves a deal. Okay. So after recording this, which came out many years later, and we need to talk about this on the show by everybody, it also features Prairie Prince, Steph Burns, Tim Gorman, Marty Friedman. Anyway, um, the trio stuck together and put together the storm with Smith and Rowley. So the self titled debut came out in 1991 produced by Bo Hill. It reached the 
heady heights of number 133 in the US Billboard charts. Uh, but the single I've Got A Lot To Learn About Love, which is a bit long for a single title, did get to number 26 yeah. in the US Billboard Hot 100. And a second album was recorded with Ron Wixell on drums, who played with David Glenn Isley and Dave Menachetti and loads of different people. Uh, but the band had already really folded by the time it came out in 1995 through Music for Nations. Uh, and many think that it is the better of the two. I probably won't argue too much with that, but I would suggest it's now pretty much largely forgotten. So we've decided to plump for this to talk about. There we go. Cool. Simon, your thoughts on the storm? Clearly, this one's better. Um, but uh, just, yeah, this one, thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that just amongst the worst covers of history, history of mankind? <laughs> I mean, this one's rivaling it hard. It's pushing it hard, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that one. it but in no way does it sc scream melodic rock, does it? You know, it it's, it's a bit hypnosis, isn't it? You know, just I mean, look, look. Look, and, that, and then, you, then, you, then you look at them. Whoa, really? I don't know what Ross Valerie looks like, but it would get me sacked from the uh, sea of tranquility <laughs> if, I, if I was to say it, you know. But um, I, I actually really, again, I really like this album. I was astonished when I was looking, looking at it earlier. A, that I found it, because clearly I've listened to it recently and then put it back in what many people are describing as the wrong place and it's taken me much of the day to find it certainly wasn't in the <laughs> storm section but anyway there we go um the first seven or eight of these are all great i really really like this record um you keep me waiting nice nice huge drum sound huge drum sound big big almost like there's a storm coming Ooh, see what i did there thank you thank you thank you. and that that's that's throughout and uh, Bo Hill, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm doing this from memory. Produced Prisoners in Paradise by um, Europe. Oh, oh, you've put us all on the spot there. Oh, I was going to start Googling. Which is uh, well, another of my very, very... I will look it up while you talk. I will look, look it up while I, pa while I pop on about this. Um, I've got a lot to learn about love. It's a fantastic song. and I've really, Quite a lot of these songs... Um, or to my my ears, and you know I'm not a, not a biggest fan of the band, quite beatly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Excellent, glad we're on the same page. And I really like the uh, um, the guitars, and I've got a lot to learn about love um, because Stephen they're jangly, but not in a Smiths kind of way. Before you uh, hit the button, more panic, you know they they you know they're just really just there in the background, work, working away, really good. Now I know a lot of people hate in the raw, but it tickles me every time I hear it. It, it really does, you know, especially the bit about her matching her, her, her cuffs, yeah, accessorized by a nice pair of cuffs, okay, because <laughs> I'm a child, yeah, call me, it's a, re it's a really good solid record, and do you remember previously when I said that um, I like the Bad, Eng Bad English records more than anything since Rays on Radio done by Journey, mm -hmm. I like both of these more than anything the journey of release since <clears throat> raised on radio yeah I'm going, I'm going for it you know but you know you think about things and i've got is it what it's a one or two two fires album two so i've definitely got one of them and at no point since it initially came out i thought you yeah, really must play that <laughs> i know that i've got it so that may well be uh getting dug out um, at some point for a future show. You know, it's just, there's that much product that sounds like Journey, has members from Journey in, um, is Journey-esque. So the singer sounds like Steve Perry. There's that much. Do you know what? I'd argue, I'll wager, that's one of the reason, reasons nobody buys melodic rock anymore because everything sounds like Journey. Shit Journey. <laughs> there you go. I've called it. I feel like uh, I feel like my work here is done. But uh, it, it's a it's a really good, solid record. M really, really memorable tunes. Yeah. Really memorable tunes. Um, this one's better. This real better. Yeah. But uh, we're not talking about that one this week. But it's better. Uh, as always, Mister Bray, Uncle Simon is correct. The follow up 
is better but it is largely forgotten so we went for this album because it did have some sort of chart presence it did kind of go somewhere and yeah I mean the cover is dark and it's dreary and I know they're called The Storm I know they're playing on that I mean the album opens with the sound of rain it closes with the sound of rain I mean do we need to sell it that hard? Is it is that is the band name that good? I don't know. Anyway, I mean you can hear why Kevin Shalfon is kind of given a bit of a hard time for being a Steve Perry clone, but I think he's better than that. There's a little bit of a deeper register going on here, and he doesn't have to ape the great man. He's not doing that as Karang would say the duck thing. Um, but I also think that's a quite a good description for this. It is very journey. That kind of is natural with who's in the band. I also think that it is a little bit darker than what Journey would naturally do. I don't think that it's quite so obvious as to some of the Journey stuff that had come before. I mean obvious because we had all these albums up to this point. And, and I do think that it's kind of moving things into the kind of more realms of melodic hard rock as opposed to being out and out pure AOR. But where it really drives home is the songwriting. The songwriting is really good. The standard is strong throughout, Simon mentioned. I mean, the hit single, I've got a lot to learn about love. Difficult to say, but it does its job perfectly. Maybe it's maybe the most derivative thing that's on the album. It's certainly memorable, though. I mean, it's catchy as hell. And how Kevin Shelfont never got the breaks to become a household name, I'll never know, because it's not just on this album he's great. He's really good on, on everything that he does, and he seems to be very much a kind of Division two. You know, kind of singer, he's looked upon as that guy that fronted lots of bands that were never going to make it. He was always the voice to go to if you wanted to sound like Journey. He's much, much better than that. Do you know? When he's high enough in the mix, Josh Ramos's guitars are really good on this. You can see why he did become a bit of a an in-demand kind of guy as well. His efforts can get a little buried at times. I like the grittier stuff that's on the album, the kind of riff-led stuff, and it's still got lots of keyboards in it too. I mean, there's in the raw. I don't mind it. Forceful keep uh, keep me waiting. Sorry, is really forceful. I, I really like that. It does have something of the Geoffrey's about it. Fall enough, but then there's a little bit of blues almost in Gimme Love, um, and then I like the more melodic stuff on it too, like Still Loving You, which is almost Journey meets Mike and the Mechanics. There's a bit, little bit of the that kind of smoothness in the backing vocals. Uh, and I like Can't Live Without Love. I, I really like this album in general. Well, I go as far as Simon has to say it's better than anything Journey I've done since Raised on Radio. Uh, that's maybe a little bit of a stretch. But I probably listen to it more often than most Journey post that period, to be fair. So that tells its story in itself. This is an album that deserves much better. Uh, and as we've already said, the follow-up is even stronger. And that maybe was the album that should have taken them somewhere. This was a solid, really solid first step. The second album is what should have taken them over the top, but it came too late, the band was done, and as the stories go now, that's that really, isn't it? And then we're all back in Germany and doing various things and sliding yeah. off on other projects. So yeah, I really like this, and if you haven't heard it, it's highly recommended. So I, I bought this on CD when it first came out, and uh, needless to say, somewhere along the way, I got rid of it. So this was the first time I revisited this in quite some time. And uh, I will say, yeah, it just kind of sounds like a long lost journey album. Um, you know, Kevin sounds in spots a lot like Steve Perry. Uh, you got a lot of similar type of song arranging and things. You have a mix of harder, grittier rockers and lots, lots of ballads. For me, there's way too many ballads on this album. Um, but like Steve and I also kind of, thought in revisiting this that the the grittier more rocking stuff is actually pretty good um you keep me waiting i think is terrific uh i it was good to hear the single again i've got a lot to learn about love that was kind of a minor hit here it was played on the radio i think they had a, a video as well on mtv that's really good good melodic hard rock song very catchy um you know there's other really good stuff in the raw is really good you're gonna miss me is good Show Me The Way, I think, would have made a terrific Journey song. Um, I, You know, 
I'm not big on Still Loving You, even though I'm kind of psyched that Greg Raleigh sings on it, because I love Greg Raleigh's voice, but he kind of shares it with Kevin, and it's I don't really like the song that much, uh, even though he's on there. Touch and Go totally kicks ass. I want to hear more of that. Um, you know, Give Me Love is pretty good. I like that. A lot of good guitar playing on that. But like, man, like Take Me Away, Can't Live Without You, Ugh, just boring to me. I don't know. I think that's my problem with this album in revisiting. And that's probably the reason why I got rid of it all those years ago. There's like maybe like five or so tracks that I really like that I think are really good. And then the rest of the album for me is just really just kind of fluffy and forgettable. And I think that's why I just gravitated away from this. And, it, you know, for me comparing this album and uh, I think I heard the second album maybe once I never owned it um, to like the bad English stuff or like post Ra race on radio journey. Um, I'll take either of those options over this. I don't dislike this. I just think to me, half of it's really mediocre. Half of it's really good. I think they had, uh, there was something there that they could have built on, but obviously that never really happened. Then, you know, Journey got back together and that was that. So I think there's enough to recommend on here. Uh, for me, though, would I go back out and buy this again? Probably not. But was it good to re-listen to it again? Yeah, sure, sure. There's, like I said, there's about five songs on here that I really enjoyed quite a bit. The rest, eh, I can take them or leave. So I'm kind of middle, middle, middle of the road here. Okay. So that brings us to album number three. Okay, so this is from 1985, released through Columbia. And this is, yes, this is Michael Bolton. And everybody's crazy. So, uh, absolutely, this is the guy famous for some of the worst hair in 90s chart music. Okay. And also, some of the admittedly brilliantly sung. You can, no matter whether you like his material throughout his career or not, the man can sing. Okay. But he definitely provided some of the most bland, middle-of-the-road, blue-eyed soul in existence, okay? And there is no way of disguising that or apologising for it, do you know? In fairness to the guy, though, while I think that the output is turgid between, like, is it, is it Time, Love and Tenderness and Soul Provider? I mean, those two albums are just from what I've heard in the singles, garbage, for want of a better term of phrase. And they, they sold millions of copies here. Nearly 30 million copies between them. Okay. And given that he's released something like 25 studio albums over his career, I'd imagine he's not short of a bother to. You know, <laughs> so uh, you can't argue with the way the career went. Anyway, so everybody's crazy. At 1985, through Columbia, it's probably the last of his albums prior to the kind of stylistic change that brought him huge success. It was produced by Neil Kernan other than the track Desperate Heart, which was produced by its co-writer, Randy Goodrum. And that song seems to exist in some kind of bubble removed from the rest of the songs on the album, strangely enough. Um, and this was actually, I, wrongly, when we spoke about this two weeks ago, I said this was Michael's second solo album. Now, I knew that was wrong at the time, but there are distinct periods even at this point. It was his fourth solo album because he had two kind of 70s, bluesy, funky pop releases under his real name of Michael Bolotin, B-O-L-O-T-I-N. And then you had the self-titled Michael Bolton album that came before Everybody's Crazy. And he'd also been with the band Blackjack by this stage with Bruce Kulik, okay? When I put this poster up, I knew he was going to be right behind me. He's the only guy right behind me. Unfortunately, what you can see is Paul Stanley's chest wig. But anyway, okay. And also in that band was Jimmy Haslip and Sandy Gennaro, okay? So it would be fair to suggest that Bolton's solo albums are very much solo albums and not band affairs. I mean, with Everybody's Crazy, the cast list is ginormous. You've got Bruce Kulik, who plays guitar on most of the album. Um, keyboards from Ducat Soros from Balance. Look, I'll say that word quite a lot as we go through this. And also on keyboards, Lloyd Landsman, Mark Mangold, Touch, Drive She Said, House of Lords. Jan Mulaney, Mark Radis, Alan St. John, drums from Chuck Burgi from Balance, um, Rainbow, Blue Oyster Cult, Billy Joel, sax from Mark Rivera, who seems to turn up in a lot of these albums that we talk about, bass from Dennis Feldman from Balance, and then on backing vocals, you've got Terry Brock, you've got some of the best vocalists in the world on backing vocals here from Strange Ways, Pepe Castro from Balance, uh, and you've got Joe Cesarano, okay, 
And then on Desperate Heart, the thing that Randy Goodrum pretty much plays everything on, this seems to be his vehicle on this album. Um, however, the guitar is from, by Kevin Dukes, who would play with Jackson Brown and Don Henley, and Paul Pesco, who's probably best known for being part of Madonna's band. Now, the 1983 Michael Bolton self-titled album did chart in the US. It got to number 89 and did go gold, which kind of surprised me. But the only place that everybody's crazy seems to have charted anywhere is Sweden. And it got to number 45 there. So this was not a rip-roaring success. There we go. Surprising. Simon, your take on everybody's crazy. Would you, would you like me to explain why it wasn't a rip-roaring success? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Well, um, firstly, um, the cover's awful. I was staring at it whilst uh, uh, not listening to one of you earlier. And... Um, They've superimposed his face on Paul Stanley, haven't they? <laughs> really, he's bold. Yeah? I mean, who's going to buy that? I'm, 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 really? You know, he's got the sleeves rolled up and everything that you expect, but holy shit, that's awful. The font's shite. Well, the, font, no... the fonts are terrible, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then, then on the black, black one, it's like, oh, the Jeffrey Dahmer years. I mean, Jesus Christ, I mean, what's going on there? You know, oh, I mean, that's just, bleh. oh, God. Um, I will point out that mine is one of the, like, um, versions that came out, not initially, because it's got all the all the fun, nice price albums you can buy. Remember nice oh, price kids? Oh, yeah, I like, I like yeah, when you buy one those. There you go, it's got those in. And helpfully, um, the lyrics tell you both when the chorus, which is the chorus, and where the bridge is. Fantastic, <laughs> those of us. That are stupid. However, um, when 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 you listen to it, um, and I've had this a while, and, you, and I haven't listened to it for that long until we decided we're going to do it. For, mentally, you think, do you know what? If they made any videos for this, and oh yes, they have. There's going to be a drummer in the back giving it that. Yeah, there's going to be strobe lights. There's going to be. It's going to. It's it's. There's going to be hair. There's going to be so much hair. Oh my God, because this is right on the edge of what Stephen doesn't call hair metal. This is just so, so close and so um, desperately unfashionable in many ways. Now, I'm fairly surprised that, uh, which one's the ballad, he asks? Is it Call My Name? Get going, what he went, going off what he went on to do, I am relatively surprised that Columbia couldn't have made him a star with that, made him a crossover star, and he could have made some, like, not terrible music for the next 40 years. Because this is practically where it stops for him. It, you know, yeah. however, you're in Poughkeepsie, you're in Perth, I'm here in Lancashire, he's probably got 12 houses. At least. You know, um, you know, it's it's a decent eighties rock album, with but there's nothing that stands out and says, "Oh, pick me, buy me, buy me, buy me, buy me." But I really, I really like the title song. I like pra practically everything. It's that's my that's my that's the go to phrase for today. I like practically. It's an album that makes me happy. All these all these albums this this week make make me happy. I know they're not masterpieces. Um, it's produced by Neil Kernan. Neil Kernan produced Tough It Out. What a guy. Just for that, he's one of my favourite people um, on on the planet. You know, it's, it's one of those records you think, well, do you know, that's really commercial. That is really, really commercial. And it sold about eight copies, didn't it? You know, it just, you know, it just really didn't. It, he is an excellent, excellent singer, as you say, no matter what. But by Christ, the material he shows for the rest of his career... Oh, have you heard his vision of sitting on the dock of the bay? Tried oh. to pretend that I haven't, but yes, I have. Yeah. Oh, um, most of us have tried to wipe it from our memory banks, but yeah. Yeah, just, just no. But he's, he's always liked to cover, hasn't he? You know, he really has. He was doing Rocky Mountain way beforehand, wasn't he? And, and um, dancing in the street, he's always liked a bad cover. And, and with that voice, you think he could do something with covers and make them really, really great. But no, how wrong we are. How very, very wrong. But as a melodic rock album, this stand, stands the test of time. It's perfectly, perfectly adequate. He said, 
predominate with very, very faint praise. You know, Bruce is all over it, isn't he? Yeah. Bruce, bruising it up. You could you, you could see Paul Starmer singing some of those. Yeah, and he went on to sing forever, didn't he? You know, you could see you could see him doing doing it. And it, it's an entirely serviceable, if at times relatively forgettable record. But it's so much better than say his version of To Love Somebody or anything else he went on to do. When a man loves a woman. Oh. You do realise that the MILF market is now leaving us left, right and centre, aren't you? There was no MILF market watching us. What are you talking about? <laughs> really? Sure. We thought that was our thing. And probably your thing, Simon, yes. I believe that you're, you're bringing that demographic. I like to think so. You like the hair, isn't it? It really... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Um, it's, it's fine. It, it, it is... The best thing to, in my mind that he's put his mind to it, except for um, the lonely, lonely island thing. Okay, excellent. Thanks for that. That's so perfectly adequate, and it's fine. That's that would appear to be the conclusion that we've got from Simon. I think it's worth mentioning, considering this guy went on to be famous for some of the worst. And yes, he liked the cover version by the stage already. That some of the worst cover versions to sell millions of copies ever in the history of middle of the road. Rock music. That's so we're going with rock music? Is that where we're going? I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's not pop. It's pop. But I don't quite know what it is. But he actually writes or co-writes everything on this album. I mean, he's clearly absolutely ensconced in what's going on here. What I will say, though, is that the first two solo albums are very of their time. They're kind of mid-70s, late 70s things. There's a bit of a funky groove, and he sings really well on them. And you think, well, that's clearly what he loved back then. Then you have the Black Black Jack albums, which are harder hitting, much more authentic. And you think, well, that was kind of happening at that point. Then you hear these albums, and you think, well, hmm, that was happening at that point. And then you see what he broke massive with, and you think, okay, basically he's sing anything that would sell. And that would appear to be the ethos that we've gone through. So even by, like, album number six in his career, we're already just chasing the dream. And why would you not if it can get you 12 houses or whatever it is? I think he owns the Bahamas. I'm not quite sure. Do you know? But in, in that sense, it is really quite convincing. He means it. I mean, I was brought to this album by this guy. That's why we've changed the poster this week. Okay, I was brought to this album by Bruce Kulik because this I bought back in an age where if a member of Kiss had played on something, you could have my cash, thank you very much. This, thankfully, is one of the ones where actually you can hear the guy play on it. Oh, yeah. Bruce Cooper already has a sound. And it surprised me going back and listening to this, you realise he was allowed to bring that sound into Kiss. Because you can hear, and I didn't actually have other options. I don't have a lot of this either, posters from the band. But some of the stuff on this could fit on Crazy Nights. I could imagine some of this, it's about the kind of reason to live sort of thing. If you like Kiss doing AOR, you might quite like some of this, do you know? Um, but it's a strange one. I think it's a strange, because this guy can sing, and there's absolutely no two ways about it. But there's a kind of Foreigner-like vibe to some of the stuff that's going on here. But I don't mean early Foreigner, when they, they were kind of making their name. I mean that they kind of got comfortable, and they were making strong albums that were just a little bit safer, and that's kind of where like things like start breaking my heart kind of land. Majestic vocals. I mean, he's really, really good. And as Simon mentioned, and I've got in my notes, if he could have had a break at this point, I think he'd still be doing this kind of thing because it is convincing enough. It doesn't feel hackneyed, you know? Um, and same again, I, I think on Can't Turn It Off, I think Mark Mangold is channeling that kind of foreigner keyboard stab that's on it. You can hear exactly what they're trying to do. And that's maybe the slight issue, is you can hear what they're trying to do. Now, more than most albums that are trying to do something, I think everybody's crazy. And Simon is spot on again. The title track is fantastic. It is the song from these three albums that when I finished listening to them again the other day, it's the one that had stuck in here everybody's crazy that's the bit i'm left with from all three of these albums it's just a shame that it's not all quite as memorable as that but mm. i think vocally it's almost a blend of lou graham and paul rogers at certain points on this like what a vocalist what a vocalist and the production from neil kernan 
I think is really good, you know? Uh, and that makes it very odd to have that kind of one track on the album that's that doesn't belong. Desperate Hard just feels like something else entirely. It's got a different drum sound. It doesn't open the album or close the album. It's right in the middle. It's this kind of strange thing because it doesn't become a hit. It doesn't really do anything. It's the only real misstep on the whole thing for me. I think this is strong <laughs> from start to finish. It's held up as a real kind of underground classic. It arguably could have fallen to either category that we do the, the underground classic or the He Made an AOR album. Definitely the latter because everyone knows what this guy went on to do and that is fully what he's associated with. And there will be people that don't quite know that he did do. Not just one, but the self-titled Michael Bolton album is also pretty strong. It's also got some really good melodic rock on it. And then he goes and does, I think it's The Hunger, which I also bought because Mr. Kulik was on it. And that's just the step too far. I think Neil Sean's on that album too. I think Steve Lukather's also on there. And it's just into that step where you kind of go, ooh, I'm in the setup now. It's, that's really not very good. But Everybody's Crazy is good. I don't quite think that it deserves to be lauded in the way that lots of people do in lots of places that you'll head over to if you read lots about AOR and various things like that. However, when it's good, it's really good. It just doesn't quite hit that standard from start to finish for me. But man, can he sing? Well, I mean, that's that that was my takeaway from this. So I had never heard this album before. I'm well familiar with him. And unfortunately, I'm more familiar with the, the crappy stuff that will come later on because you couldn't escape it here. Just could not escape him here. Um, this guy can sing. He can sing the phone book if he wanted to. But I think what really hit me hard, and I, I have the uh, Black Heart. Is that the name of the band, right? Blackjack. Blackjack. Uh, I have the Blackjack uh, compilation. And that's good stuff. Um, and I've, I've heard some stuff from his first solo album as well, uh, the, the self-titled one, <clears throat> which is not actually the first one. Um, but I'd never heard this album before. But man, I mean, this guy, if he wanted to, he could have been a great hard rock singer throughout his whole career, if that's what he really wanted to. Because, and if you don't believe me, listen to Save Our Love and Everybody's Crazy, which kick off this album. To me, they're the strongest songs on the whole album, and it kind of sets a tone, which I don't know if it holds throughout the whole album, but I mean, you got these big choruses. He sounds strong and passionate and confident, and there's hooks on there, and there's lots of big guitars. And I think Michael Bolton with big guitars, to me, to my ears, works. I don't want to hear Michael Bolton with orchestras and just synths and all this back. It's like, ah, you know, whatever. Uh, that's that's not what I want to hear. Uh, and granted, that's what most people want to hear from him, at least here. But that doesn't really work for me. Um, I think Bruce Kulick does some great stuff on this album. And it's funny, before I went and looked at like who played on the album and I listened to it first, I thought it was his brother Bob right off the bat because he was doing more stuff on this album that I normally associate with the way that Bob plays, you know, lots of like whammy bar stuff and all that more kind of like wild and crazy playing. And I was pleasantly surprised that it was, that it was Bruce. I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Right. Um, Start breaking my heart is okay. You know what I noticed too? I wrote it in my notes. He, on the heavier songs on this album, not that anything's really heavy, but the more rocking stuff, he reminds me of Dave Medichetti from y t a little bit in spots. Yeah, there's that kind of throatiness there. Yeah, yeah the inflection too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I also in, uh, admit as well, Desperate Heart doesn't really sound like it fits here. Uh, Call My Name, ugh, I did not like that at all. To me, that's a precursor to where he would go shortly after this. Um, you Don't Want Me Bad Enough, I think is really good. Um, I don't know. To me, there's a nice mix of hard rockers and more battle type stuff here. But it doesn't, other than like a track or two, it doesn't get into complete mush like we would hear from him not that long after. Uh, I don't think personally I would ever need to own this, but I thought it was a pretty decent listen. And I had, I enjoyed it. And I, you know, I was left coming away from this album with, wow, what could this guy have done if he would have stayed on with this sort of thing um because be penniless. what's that be absolutely penniless well and that's that's true but i mean you know simon you brought up a good point before that some of this album doesn't sound too far removed from all that popular hair metal stuff that we had here um so i don't know it maybe if he would have, or maybe he was a little too late to that ball game or maybe he should have stuck out for another album or two maybe if he got a little more rocking and stopped with the ballads i don't know but 
it's funny listening to this and knowing what was selling here anyway in the States. I'm actually kind of shocked that these albums from him didn't do anything, that it took him to do like all these ballads and schmaltzy, you know, soul and R&B stuff. And that's what people latched on to. Um, but uh, this stuff, this got ignored. I mean, completely. I, I'd never even heard of this album before. Um, and he was he was basically nobody until all of a sudden, you know, he had that first, uh, you know, really big album a couple of years later. But uh, yeah, but no, this is a decent listen. The guy's got an amazing voice. The cover is ridiculous. He looks ridiculous, but you know, whatever. Uh, I think there's some there's some quality on here. Again, I would never need to own it or buy it, but uh, I enjoyed listening to this. This was cool. Again, the guy can sing, and this really affirmed that. And I think hearing him in this context for me was was pretty cool and kind of an eye opener because like I always knew the guy could sing, but it's just like you listen to all the stuff that like people bought in droves. You're like, oh my god, yeah, he's got a good voice. But if I have there, I'm about to hear that fucking song again. I'm gonna put a gun to my head, right? Just joking, but uh, but yeah. Um, so this this was enjoyable. This was enjoyable. Yeah, I can't help but wonder if he'd managed to get something like everybody's crazy tagged on to some kind of breakfast club kind of movie sort of thing. If that wouldn't have been what would have taken him over the top. But at the same time, when I do look at the the album cover and the other ones around this time. I do wonder if if he ended up where he ended up because he was always going to appeal to Simon's Milf market as opposed to, I mean, he's never going to be like in that, and I hate the phrase, but I will use it, in that hair era. I mean, how how un, it's not just that it's a bad cover, how uncomfortable does this guy look? Yeah. I mean, you can tell he's looking at this going, who put me in this? Why on earth am I standing here wearing this stuff? And they've done what to my hair? I mean, and admittedly, that is better than any hairstyle you'll see since. But it still, it still looks like it's been pretty onto his head, doesn't it? It's just yeah. nothing here. And the whole cover just looks cheap, like beyond belief. Even if you just get past the photograph, I mean, the rest of it—the logo, the the title, yeah. whatever the gray oh, yes. shit in the background—it's like, what is it supposed to be? Is it water? Is it a sidewalk? I don't know. A mountain? I don't know. Who the hell knows, right? I looked at this other day and looked at it and thought this is all greater than Michael Bolton. It just came out at a time when vinyl was still a thing, and you go, yeah. you go, you're going, oh, that looks fucking awful. <laughs> I'll just keep going on that base section. Yeah, that yeah. looks. Oh, this one looks a lot better. I'll buy that. You know, it's just uh, no. I still can't even tell what that is. You know, is it is it steps behind him? Is it a window behind him? There's certainly um, no suggestion of craziness, is there? Yeah. It looks like the start of something that, and I don't know if you can say his name these days, but that Rolf Harris would paint to confuse people before he turned it into some sort of painting. Well, I absolutely can't tell what it is yet. Let's get on. So all of that then, thank you. Thank you for that. All of that then leads us to the question. I think I know the answer from you two. So Peter, if you could only keep one of these three albums, you have to put the other two in the bin, which would it be you would keep? Well, obviously the only one I can really say is I would keep the Asia. Um, the thing is, I've heard it so many times in my life, I, I probably never would need to hear it again. So I have it stocked up in here. So if I had probably if I had to keep a uh, an actual physical copy of something, I mean, I'd, I'd probably take the storm. Nah, I would take the Asia. Who, who am I kidding? Even though I never need to hear it again. It's like, no, I, I would probably, yeah, I would take the Asia. It's, you know. Okay, Simon? I'm not only going to keep the storm, I'm going to put it back in the right place. Yes. It, maybe... Maybe not in the next couple of months. It'd probably stay down here like everything. I mean, I mean Led Zeppelin is actually stuck to the radiator. I mean, ah, yes, um, yeah. I, I would keep. I would keep the storm, but I would most certainly keep the second one more. I find this really difficult to answer because the honest truth is that compared to some of the other shows we've done, and I have had all these albums for a long time, and and I like all three. I don't need. In the same way that I have some of the other albums that we've spoken about, I don't need any of the three of these. I really like the Asia album when I put it on and then I take it off and immediately think, it's a bit cheesy. As soon as it stopped playing, I go, yeah, there's way too much cheese on that album. I'll never listen to that ever again. And then I play it and go, oh, it's fromage. It's not just cheese. It's, it's better than that, do you know? Um, so if I was going to have to take one, I'd... 
Oh, yeah. I was going to say this because because everybody's crazy is the best song out of the three, but it's going to be that because that's the album that I would listen to start to finish out of the three of them. But it's a really close run thing this time. I don't I don't deeply love any of the three of those albums, even though I've had them all for decades. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it's it, for me. It's kind of weird because I. I I don't really need to hear the Asia anymore because I know it so well. And I certainly don't need to own the other two. So it's almost like it, it wins by default here. But, you know, I, I do like the Asia album quite a bit. I always have. But, yeah. If, if, if someone told me, you, you can't take any of these three with them, I'd be like, okay, I'll live. <laughs> I, I like all of them, right? I, I like all of them, but yeah. I, are any of them mandatory? No, probably not. There's so. albums that I've already left behind from previous shows that I would take in front of any of these three. Uh, yeah, 100%. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, what do we have in two weeks, fellas? That's right. By popular demand, mm-hmm. this 30-year anniversary of Coverdale Page, we are going to rank the songs on that classic album. And if you don't think that that's a classic album, well, too bad we do. So, <laughs> do we? Yes. Well, yes. Definitely. Definitely. I'm doubtful of that. We will see what happens in two weeks, right? But yeah, it's 30th anniversary of Coverdale Page, uh, a very strong album, in my opinion, and uh, it'll be interesting to try and rank the songs on that one. So, that's our next assignment. So uh, for all of you watching, uh, start ranking the songs on Coverdale page. You got two weeks to do it. So uh, get cracking and uh, we'll see you in two weeks here. Saturday, the whatever date that is, because I'm I'm not good with calendar dates and all that kind of stuff. So whatever date that happens to be two weeks from today, that's what we'll be doing. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Man, I, I did not keep up with the drinking today. I'm not finished either. I've been talking far too much. Oh, so it's empty. All right. At least one of us, at least one of us uh, did some good here. So thanks for watching, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow on Ranking the Albums. Till then, uh, for Simon Brain, Stephen Reed, IMP Pardo. Have a good one, everybody. Good night, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it might be. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.